Um, much like the bee that we had a fortnight ago on love, tonight's subject of prayer is very hard to put a complete handle on. And I'm feeling very, very inadequate at uh, being here trying to do so, much like Michael felt a, cu a couple of weeks ago. But the bottom line to prayer, I guess, and the other two nights that we've had on reading and love, is really all about relationships. So if we were to think about the first night that we had on reading, Brother Andrew spoke uh, to us on how we have to read. And particularly, we have to read God's Word. But as well as that, we could read good books that help us to understand God's Word. And we can read simple good books, and we could read hard good books um, to help in that way. Not necessarily in a doctrinal sense, though we could do that, but to search God's heart, to search God's will and his spirit, and to know God and to understand God. That's why we should read, more so, and to understand where he is coming from so that we might be in that same place. So really then, reading is God talking to us, isn't it? We all know that uh, you can't get close to somebody unless you really know them. And I'm sure we've all made the mistake before of summing somebody up before we really know them. And then when we do know them, we go, oh, they weren't that kind of person at all. We often feel very embarrassed about that, but we should not make that same mistake with God. Brother Bob Lloyd spoke once that reading was a bit like um, if you had a many of us older ones have to remember a long way back, if we got a love letter or a card from a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner perhaps, you wouldn't just put it away for safekeeping and not open it. You would want to open it to see what they were saying. And so that's the attitude that we need when we come to the Bible and God's word in whatever form that might be, that we really have to want to open it and want to read it. So that was three weeks ago. And a fortnight ago, Michael spoke on love and that relationships are very complex and involve many aspects and facets of love, self-sacrifice, head love, where we decide to love come what may, benevolent love, where we just want to bestow kindness, heart love, where it just happens, Emotional love, the feel-good love, the warm and fuzzy love. Gooey love, the in-love love that we probably don't like talking about much, but God did in Song of Solomon. And the favourite old slipper sort of love, uh, where we have comfortable acceptance of those about us despite their faults. And all of these types of loves are needed. And as Michael said, we don't need to be able to split them all apart and uh, know them. We have to embrace them and do them. So each type of love has a different place and time and situation and nuance. And the only shoe that fits love completely is the shoe that we have to desire to love and we have to be skilled to be able to do it. Our Lord showed us how to do it. He commanded us how to do it, and we really have no excuse not to. And if God made all of these different types of love, and all of, them, all of the ones that I mentioned are in the Bible, um, well, then he expects us to use all those different types, and not only amongst each other, but also towards him. And he also wants to love us in those ways too. So why should we recap on the, those two things? Because really this is the segue into prayer tonight. When all is said and done, prayer is a conversation with God. And as such, prayer follows directly on from the conversation that God is having with us through reading and God loving us. And we cannot separate these three things. 
Like life with our partners, we cannot have love without talking. Conversation is a big part of relationships. Conversation with God, then, is probably the, the major thing that we have to do to have that relationship with him. So it's important, and it's important that we get it right. So what is prayer, then? <clears throat> um, I think it's important that we take perhaps a little step back. Like all relationships, prayer is a form of communication. They can be simple and fun so that even children can, can do it, or extremely complex and hard work as us adults tend to have a habit of making things. So first and foremost, prayer is that, communication, and we have to understand it as that. And in our complex natures, we always begin to think, well, who's prayer for? Is it for God or for us? God already knows our thoughts before we say them, so what's really the point? And as in Isaiah 65 uh, that we looked at this morning, it said in verse 24, before they call, I will answer. So God does know what's going on inside us. But this is us mechanising prayer, and we shouldn't really do that. We need to forget about mechanising prayer because that verse went on to say, while they are yet speaking, I will hear. So it's for both of us, isn't it? It's for us and for God. It's about the relationship. It's the connection. With our reading tonight from John 17, we have Jesus' longest recorded prayer. And uh, if we were just to look there in verse 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word. So it's not only praying for the disciples, it's praying for those who believe through the disciples' words, and that's us. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So those words that we have there are words of love and care. And Jesus also prays that we all may be one with each other, with Christ, and with God our Father. So there's a unity there that he's, he's pleading for, a union of hearts and minds and wills. And with a tiny little word there that harks back and sends our minds back to the very first union. And it's the word one. If we were to think of Genesis 2 and verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one. So our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father want this same kind of relationship with us. They want that oneness, that togetherness, as Adam and Eve were to share. So as Adam and Eve would walk the garden and talk and share and love, so our God is after that with you and I. That's what he is after. God really does see us as his wife. Perhaps we better turn back to Isaiah and chapter 54 because um, God many times talks about us being like a wife to him. <clears throat> Isaiah 54 and verse 5 and 6 says, and this particularly applies to Israel, but it equally applies to us. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth. So for us men, this 
might be a bit hard for us to imagine. We often refer to us as the ecclesia, as the bride of Christ. But Isaiah here is taking it a little step f further than that. It's not collective that he's talking about. It's us individually. It's a little more intimate. God wants to be our husband, personally and individually. And as such, he wants to talk to us. And he wants us to talk to him. And luckily for us, God doesn't go into his man cave when things are not quite working out properly. And so this kind of imagery is uh, quite a bit around in scripture. If we were to go to Hosea chapter 1, and I haven't got the page number like um, Trevor had this morning, which was such a great thing. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2 says, The beginning of the word of the Lord, of Ho Ho Lord by Hosea, And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and the children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So this is going on with the same theme, and it's, a, it's Israel being likened to the wife of God. And so Hosea was to take a wife, and not a very good wife, and to, to marry her and to live with her to show to the people that that was how God is prepared to live with us. And going on in chapter 3, in verse 1 to 3, it says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet love a woman beloved of her friend, an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I, I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. So this is a very moving section of scripture when you, you read the whole lot here, starting in chapter 1. And it's almost shocking imagery. And like Hosea had to love this woman and take her and try and stop her dalliances, God wants us, despite our massive shortcomings and what goes wrong. He loves us dearly and wants that love reciprocated to him. And the love of, from God to us is very broad, as we mentioned earlier, and described in terms here that we understand of us with our partners. And so Hosea here is, is telling us those things so that we understand the kind of love that God has and will always have for us. God has eloquently spoken to us through his word and so as brother Harry Tennant once said about our relationships, so brethren, talk, talk, talk. So that's what we have to do to God. So where does prayer stop and start? So if prayer is a conversation, perhaps it's a little more than that. Because we all have a little person inside of us, talking to us. And in fact, in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says it's not just one person, it's actually two. Because he says in verse 21, I find then a law that when I, I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man... But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So the Apostle Paul talks about what's going on inside of us, this conversation that is constantly going on inside of our hearts and minds, inside of our heads, 
Sometimes we see them in cartoons as little Tweety birds or something. But that's exactly what's going on inside. Paul saw this as a bit of a battleground and most of the time, I guess, the little person is talking about mundane things and everyday things of life. But the more we become God's wife, the more we start to think about him and his ways and the more that battleground takes place perhaps and the closer we come to understanding our God. It was probably David that wrote uh, part of Psalm 119 in 90, verse 97 where it says, O how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. So David here gives us the idea that that little person inside of us should be talking and not just every now and again all day. And what should it be talking about? God and his words. Oh how love I thy law, my meditation all the day. And the word meditation there means reflection, devotion, meditation, prayer. It's got quite a broad range of meanings. It's not just meditation. Which highlights the problem that we have is, is there really a distinction between meditation and thinking and prayer? And of course there is if we like to break it all up and to have little nuances about that. But the reality is that all of these things and self-analysation, self-examination, self-understanding and perhaps even a bit of singing may be in there as well are things that would make up all of what David is describing here as happening. And perhaps we can think of David on the, in the hills of Israel tending the sheep where all of these things would have been blending together at all different times throughout the day. So we break into prayer and we break into meditation and we break into thinking and reflecting and we think of God and we think of us and we think of all of those things and they, they circle around all the time. And that's, that's the idea of this. And so it's really more a constant flow of conscious thought and, that's, and it's going back and forward all the time. And in fact when we stop and think about it um, logically, uh, meditation is talking to yourself, prayer is talking to God, but if God doesn't answer those prayers directly, which he doesn't, well then the lines get blurred a little bit anyway, don't they? I remember many years ago, Brother um, Brian Lukes saying, um, what is it that separates us from those about us? And this was sort of a throwaway paragraph at the start of one of his exhorts, but it really resonated with me at the time because he said, when we're mowing the lawn like the next door neighbour is mowing the lawn, what's the difference between us and them? Is there a difference between us and them? And he went on to say, the only thing that's different is what's going on inside, what we're thinking about while we're mowing the lawn. And it's quite a profound comment, isn't it? So we could headline that, what do we think about when we've got nothing else to think about? And the answer has to be God, doesn't it? So we have that circlic thing happening all the time, as much as we can. And Harry, Brother Harry Tennant, had a similar statement once when he said changing the baby's nappy is as important as the memorial meeting. And I remember that being a, quite a shock at the time. And it sounds terrible when you first hear it, but what he was trying to say was that all of our life should have this constant stream of thought going through it. And if that is our life, well then we can't break it into segments of better and less and good and bad we could, because it's all going on together and so our, our mind when we're changing the baby's nappy should be running through a similar process as it would be 
if we're sitting here. So God wants to be that little person inside of our head, talking to us, motivating us, directing us and caring for us. Isaiah 66 talks a little about that. So discipleship, though, is all about Christ. And disciples are learners, as we spoke of in Brother Andrew's class. So we have to learn from Christ. So what did Jesus do? How did Jesus pray? Well, we were given a very succinct pattern of prayer in what is described as the Lord's Prayer, which was the response to one of the disciples saying, uh, which was uh, Luke 11 verse 1, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. So his answer was the Lord's Prayer, which is also found in Matthew 6. But we know that Jesus was often up all night in prayer and had very long communion with his Father, much longer than the Lord's Prayer. And the John that Ellie read for us tonight, John 17, is a lovely prayer of Christ's, both for himself and for his disciples and for us. And the prayer starts with the Father and ends with the Father and in between is mostly about other people, though it is about himself as well. So it's a good habit for us to get into our thoughts and our words that our prayers are more often with others than they are with ourselves. We should try and get into that habit of making that what we do. So it was the longest of Jesus' prayers, but it really didn't end there because that was in the upper room and from there he went out with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley, up onto the Mount of Olives and continued in prayer for more hours with God. And so this continuous thought is happening. Perhaps we need to turn to Luke 22 to see the continuation of the prayer that we had in John 17. Luke 22 and verse 39. And it says here, and he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. So he told them to pray. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground and when he rose up from prayer he was come to his disciples he found them sleeping for sorrow and he said unto them why sleep ye rise and pray lest ye enter into temptation so Jesus' prayer here is an agonising prayer, isn't it? And this is a real prayer. This is an earnest prayer. And we need to d develop this kind of prayer as well. But where were the likes of you and I, the disciples? They were asleep. And not once did this happen. Not twice, but three times it tells us in Mark 14... And Jesus' words of love there at the end, pray that ye enter not into temptation. It's quite a sad scene when we read the Mark 14 version of this and he comes the third time. Because this was really important time for them to be praying. It was really important time for them to be awake. And they weren't either. And how sad it was for them because they needed God's help. They are about to, to face a big crisis and a big change. Jesus also needed their companionship in this most crucial hour. 
And at best, we are feeble creatures, aren't we, compared to our Lord. And it seems that when the going gets tough, the tough go to sleep. And the, I guess there's not a single person here in this hall who would not confess that their prayers are hopelessly inadequate compared to our Lord. So we have much to learn when it comes to talking to God, don't we? So, some practical how or what do we do. You might be surprised to know that there's 222 actual prayers in the Bible. I was. It's a lot. Great prayers, good prayers, normal prayers about normal things. Anywhere, anytime, anyhow. And even what we would think is bad prayers, there's quite a few of those when you start looking. And there are great people of prayer. Moses, Nehemiah, Job, Hezekiah, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel. Unfortunately, I only found five women's prayers. There was Hannah who prayed for a son and then Hannah also prayed for thanksgiving, for having that son. There was the woman with the issue of blood, um, Matthew 9, who prayed that if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. There was the woman who prayed uh, for a, the healing of her daughter in Matthew 15. And there was the mother of James and John who prayed for her two sons' uh, exaltation which uh, obviously went unanswered, perhaps, maybe not in the future, but uh, because of her wrong motivation and perhaps it wasn't in harmony with, with God's will. So on top of those 222 prayers, there are many other references to prayers and allusions to people praying. Um, so that's on top of that. And also on top of that, there is sections about prayer that describe talk about prayer and describe pr prayer like uh, James in his book um, talks about prayer as we know there's three or four references to prayer um, but there's no actual prayers in the book so the Bible has a great wealth of prayers and prayer information there are three giant prayers in the Bible um, the, the biggest prayer is Nehemiah, um, in Nehemiah it's where the uh, Israelites are led by the Levites in prayer of dedication for the people. 1,250 words. Solomon prays at the dedication of the temple. And then Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. But most of the prayers in the Bible are surprisingly short. Just a handful of words at most. And perhaps in your own time it would be good to com compare... Um, Nehemiah chapter 1 and Nehemiah chapter 2 because in Nehemiah chapter 1 um, there is uh, it mentions there that they had many days of prayer and fasting and mourning and then in chapter 2 there's a prayer that's obviously said in a nanosecond as Nehemiah stands before the king and so we have long prayers that go for days and we have short prayers that don't last much more than the fleeting time that it passes through our head. And so there's many different types of prayers and we can break them up if we like into mechanical prayers which some people call perfunctory prayers. I had to look up that word. Uh, it means carried out with a minimum of reflection. So perfunctory. Um, such as saying thanks for meals, um, sometimes meeting prayers, um, sometimes prayers for the readings. Um, we can have daily prayers, which uh, at least should be morning and night, um, but uh, we have two examples in scripture of, uh, of three times a day. Um, we have Daniel that we know of, and David said in Psalm 55 verse 17, Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud 
and he shall hear my voice. So that's a, a good habit to get into. And habits are good for us to form with prayer. We can have micro prayers, quick prayers uh, that we, when we need help and we need to uh, pray to God quickly, perhaps whilst we're driving. Um, and we have to make time for earnest, reflective prayers like Christ did. That's probably our biggest failing, I guess, as people, I know it is with myself. We have to make time for those and we have to force ourselves to do them. What's a good amount? I don't know. Two or three times a week would be good or more. Where we go right into the most holy place with God. So we have to remember that prayer, though, is not mechanical. It's, um, even though we form habits and we make repetition, um, it is the response to love and it's a response to the outpouring of the Spirit and the Word of God that we've been given. And it's also the little person inside of our head talking to ourselves and to God as much as possible. I used to worry a little bit about prayers and what I should be praying for. And yes, we do need to have caution. James said in 4 verse 1, we are, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. And so there's things which we're not going to get answered. I used to think that God perhaps wasn't interested in the mundane things of life. But as I've got older, I never used to pray about those things and that I was remiss in that because as I've got older I think the reality is more that um, when does a mundane thing turn into something that's something really worth praying about because often the mundane things end up being things that we really need help with and uh, so the job that's getting us down, things not working out so well, the kids not, you know, everything going wrong, life falling into a heap, the little things that were mundane end up becoming big. God is interested in our lives. We do need to pray constantly and Jesus Christ said in Luke 18, men are always to pray and not to faint. So I think we've got plenty of room for movement there to do that. So what do prayers include? I was going to, uh, I had picked out a whole heap of psalms that I was going to go to. But the more psalms that I uh, flicked through, the more <laughs> I realised that each of these psalms was a fantastic example of a really good prayer for all different types of things. So I'm not going to go there. And I think you appreciate psalms as you get older. I certainly didn't when I was young, but I do very much so now. What should our prayers include then? Well, I think it's anything. If we take a walk through Psalms, you'll see many different types of prayers on many, many, many subjects. Things that perhaps we wouldn't pray for because we feel uncomfortable. And so it would seem from Psalms that there's nothing that's really too much out of bounds. And so if we look at that list there, depression, sadness, happiness, pressures, enemies, help when things aren't going very well, when things are going great, doubt, fear, hatred, love, blessings, revenge, longing for the kingdom, asking God to hear us, God always being there for us to turn to. So all of those things and more are things that we can pray about and should. God wants to hear those things. He wants to hear from us how we're going. He wants that conversation. And for God, things such as glory and power, honour, majesty, creation, the source of all things, the kingdom to come. And if we find it hard to pray, 
And at times we do, and in times of depression it's hard to pray. And sometimes when things are really, really bad, it's hard to pray. I think it's good to pray the Bible. Just open up to Psalms and pretty much any page that you open is going to be a pr prayer that you can latch onto. And um, so open the Bible, flick through and find a Psalm that resonates with you and just read it. Because really those words were penned as, as Psalms, as songs, as prayers to God. So do we need answers to prayer? Um, it's probably the, the question on everybody's lips, including people in the world. Um, does God answer prayers? You know, um, I've sort of got a stock answer for that, and the stock answer is that we need to see God as the chairman of the board. And if we, see a big, if we think about a big company with many people working for it, the chairman of the board is the one that makes all the decisions. Uh, all the decisions rest on him, good or bad. He has to put all the, all the decisions together and he would get lots of people coming to his door, lots of emails and lots of things happening. And he has to come up with the best solution to suit all of those things, all of the time, as best he could. And I sometimes see God in that position that if we're all praying for all things, well then he's listening to all of those prayers and trying to sort them out as best as possible for all of us, for now and for the future. And we know that all things work together for good. So that's what he's doing. And so... Um, Perhaps the chairman of the board is a good way to see him. I've, I heard somebody once, many years ago, saying he's like the boss. You've, you've got a, a boss, <clears throat> you've got a request, and you go to the boss. And um, he was saying that uh, when he went to his boss, he said, I'd like to t ask you something. And he said, sure, as long as you don't mind what kind of answer I give you. Which is sort of, <laughs> that's how we approach God, isn't it? that we're not sure what the answer might be. It might be a yes, might be a no, might be later. But do we need, even need to have that stock answer, really? Does God need to answer our prayers? We really have to put God in his place, don't we? And what is that? What is God's place? Well, he's king of all the universe. He's the creator and sustainer of all life. He's the one who does have the final say in all things. So if the answer is yes or no or later or whatever the answer is, what's that really got to do with us? You know, the potter and the clay example. And how dare we presume that God has to fix up our wants as soon as we ask for them, really. If God didn't do this for his son in the garden... We read it in Luke 22, verse uh, 41, um, or 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done. We know Christ's will was not done at that time, was it? God couldn't do that for his son. Or the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And it wasn't. And Paul actually gives us the answer of why it wasn't, <laughs> which is interesting, isn't it? Unless he be exalted above measure. And dare I say that like Paul, many of us here perhaps have something in our life that God just will not get rid of for us because it's good for us to have it. No doubt many of us have prayed many times for
for help in a certain area and it seems that God may not be answering those prayers but like Paul he probably is. We have to trust God then don't we? He knows what he's doing and in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount um, Christ said ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find and knock and it shall be opened to you Skipping verse 8, it says, And what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So we need to trust God that he's better at giving gifts than what we are and we'll do a good job of that. So one big problem that we have with prayer and that we really have to fix up is that it's a simple fact and it's a true fact that we get closer to God, we talk to God more during times of hardship. And all of us who are older will know that to be true. When we've got big problems, we need God. And that's very sad, isn't it? Sad that we only go to God in earnest prayer when we need him. And we have to rectify that. And it's a little bit like deathbed repentance, isn't it? But we do it repeatedly. We don't just do it once. We do it often. And is God really our last resort to fix our problems? Have we really tried everything else and failed and, well, well, we better go to God in prayer? That's not right at all, is it? We have to change that habit so that whether good times or bad, we go to God as much as we can. There's a great saying by this chap here, John Bunyan, who wrote this, these words in 1650, which says, you, can't, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you have. And that sounds a little bit weird when you first read it. It, sounds, it seems like poor English, but he was English, so it was probably very good English. Um, but we would know him as the author of the hymn that says, that starts with, he who would valiant be. And he's actually gone down in history as uh, one of the greatest writers of uh, religious English literature. He wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Progress, which has never been out of print since that day. So, um, apart from that, um, this saying is a really good one. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have. This is talking about the power of prayer, trusting God and praying first. And this is true faith, that we, we pray to God first. We must fit prayer in first because it's more important than anything else that we can do. We can't be too busy to pray first. Um, if we were to look at personality types, um, unfortunately I'm the kind of personality type that probably can relate to Jacob fairly well. Uh, unfortunately, a little bit of Jacob, I'm too busy trying to fix things myself. This is a very bad um, personality type for model prayer, isn't it? Because if we're too busy trying to fix things ourselves, we have rarely room for God. And so we have to learn to, to pray to God first and foremost, and then whatever we do after that is a bonus. And prayer is not loafing. Um, it is work, or it should be. And we have to understand that, because uh, we have a problem in our Western culture, is that we like to, <laughs> the, perhaps the Jacob mentality, that we like to be doing things all the time. And this is a problem when it comes to thinking and meditation and prayer, because outwardly it looks like we're not doing anything. Because if you saw somebody at their desk sitting like that, you'd assume straight away they're doing nothing. 
but in reality they could be thinking very carefully about what they're doing. It's a Western culture problem. And often, if we like to be doing things, well, then we're not praying. So prayer is not downtime. Prayer is not wasted time. It is not something that we do when we've got nothing else to do and we've finally got a free minute. It must be the chief thing that we do and not the least. You can't do more than pray until you have. So some practical takeaways, perhaps. In this modern world, we have to take time, we have to make time, and we have to make opportunity to pray. We've so got so many labour-saving devices today, some time-saving devices, but are they really? Um, I think we have a real problem today. Now, um, and I love my devices as much as anyone, especially Apple ones, as you can tell. All right. So this is not just an old person having a gripe. This is somebody that's really in touch with devices. We have a problem that when we do get a spare minute, we're on the device. We're not thinking, we're not meditating, and we're not praying. What we have to do with this is put it in our pockets. And all of us know that this is a major problem everywhere. You see it on the bus, you see it everywhere, people standing around. Have they got time to think? No, they're scrolling through that. Moses said in Exodus 14, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Is that what this couple was doing? Standing still and seeing the salvation of Yahweh? Praying together? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's what this couple is doing. This, not couple, this couple of people are doing. Perhaps not. Is this looking like the relationship that we've got to, with God? Could be our relationships with each other, but let, we're taking it further tonight with our relationship. God wants this relationship of talking, him talking to us and us talking to him. Is that what our relationship looks like with God? And so we have to be very careful these days, I think, and make the decision to put this away at the right time so that we get the right communication happening. So if we're standing or at the bus stop or sitting on the bus or we have a few seconds or minutes, we need to be doing the right thing. We need to be talking, talking, talking with no distractions to God as much as we can. That's a picture of a ghost gun there. Um, when I first started work, I worked for the HL Banana Agency, which was on West Terrace. And I looked out, I started at two o'clock in the morning and I woke up about nine after having about six cups of coffee. Um, it was a terrible job that I, it was a great job, but I <laughs> didn't like getting up early. But I actually worked with about half a dozen brothers in that place. And one morning, it was a beautiful morning and the sun was shining through the, it rose over that, uh, you can imagine that. It rose at that point. And an old brother that I'd worked with for a year stood next to me and he said, you see that ghost gum over there? It's beautiful. It changes all the time. I'd worked there for a year and I'd never seen it. And he said, I, see, I watch, come out here and I look at that tree every day and I pray when the sun comes up. And I'd been there excusing myself for not having enough coffees yet that uh, that was where my mind was at, just lumping around bananas. He was an old brother whose mind was in a far better place than mine was. That was a light bulb moment for me. 
and city life is not conducive to good prayer life to our God. We have to work at it to make it work. So we have to do that. We have to make time to talk to God. We have to make good habits of prayer like David and Daniel. Put prayer as our top priority and not give it up for anything. And lastly, be alone. Enter your closet and pray to God. So Christ said about praising, um, being in your clo closet to praise God. Sometimes that might be the case. We might have to do that. Sometimes it might be in the car. But at other times, if we want really earnest, heartfelt prayer, perhaps we have to go out and find a ghost gum or we have to stand outside and look at the stars which, apart from being in the wrong hemisphere, are the same stars that Abraham saw. Or perhaps we have to look at the rising sun or the setting sun and think of the sun of righteousness who will arise with healing in his beams one day. And we have to make the most of our talking time with our Father.